be to God. Please be seated. We're getting very close to Christmas. One week away, although next week is also Advent 4, don't forget that, liturgy as well. But yeah, one week and, uh, you know, we're seeing it in our culture. More and more beautiful bulbs are brightly shining, reminding us of the light. And, uh, well, we hear more and more this little phrase, remember to keep Christ in Christmas. Got to keep Christ in Christmas. Keep Christ in Christmas. That's a good thought. But I wonder sometimes how we do that. How do we keep Christ in Christmas? Well, I'm going to read to you just a little section from that marvelous first lesson that was read here, Isaiah 61. I love the prophet Isaiah. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me and sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. And then he goes on to say what that day of vengeance is like. It's very marvelous. By the way, this is Gaudet Sunday in the French tradition, Joy Sunday, Rejoice Sunday, and there's joy in these lessons. Okay, what is the vengeance of our God? Well, it's to comfort all who mourn. Isn't that an interesting idea of God's vengeance against evil? To comfort those who mourn. To provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes. Gaudet! Rejoice, rejoice, joy. To give them the oil of gladness instead of mourning. The mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. This is not what we usually think of as the day of our Lord or the day of vengeance of our God. But it's exactly what this text is. Now, I'm going to move you forward to a passage I know you know already. In the New Testament, on the day of Jesus' first homily, 30 years old, he comes to his hometown. You know the story from Luke. And what does Jesus do? Well, let's take a look. Uh, Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. This is after his baptism by John and his encounter with Satan in the desert. And a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. But when he came to Nazareth, I've been there, marvelous little town, uphill country, you know, uh, inconsequential in the area, Nazareth. When he comes to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Notice, this is not an accident on the part of Jesus. He thought it out. He was given the scroll. That's how it's done in the synagogue. An assistant gives usually a lay reader the scroll to read before the rabbi does a homily. And Jesus is searching for something. What? Our first lesson. <laughs> he says... The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. There it is. Because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. What? It goes on. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free. It's all in there, trust me. I won't keep going back and forth. You've got it in front of you. It's the very passage. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Notice he doesn't say to proclaim the year of God's vengeance, which is the first one. He's making sure everybody knows what this day of vengeance is. And how God's justice is meted out, not ours. And he rolled up the scroll 
gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, I think you know what he says, don't you? But I'll read it. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled. The anointed one of God, who sent to the poor, to those who cry, to those who mourn, to those who are oppressed. This is the Christ we keep in Christmas, folks. Because otherwise it turns into some sort of trite, saccharine sentimentality. The Christ of Christmas is the one who's going to the poor people, to the oppressed. Oh, but it gets better. Some of them said, wait a minute, is this not Joseph's son? And you remember, I've been telling you that in the Middle East, you have a status that is given to you as you're born. If you're a guy, you do what your daddy does. What was Jesus supposed to do? He's supposed to be a carpenter. And they're, oh, I wish you could, if this were a movie, you could see them. They're scratching their heads. Wait a minute. Uh, first of all, he said that the scripture of the great prophet Isaiah has been fulfilled in him. That got me wondering. And number two, he's supposed to be a carpenter. And Jesus goes on. <laughs> he says, oh, I tell you, no prophet, you know, is accepted in the prophet's hometown. I get that, you folks. And then he has two zingers. <laughs> you remember I was telling you about uh, thrust and repose, the Middle East, kind of bantering back and forth and argumentation. Jesus is an expert at it. He says, oh, oh two stories while I'm still standing here. There were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, 600 years before. When the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them but a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. Foreigners. Actually, enemies. Is that a zinger or what? Yeah, there were a lot of widows that were starving. And yet, the prophet Elijah was sent not to them, but to those other ones. The ones you hate. Let's just be honest. This is no trite, saccharine, sentimental Christmas. Christ, this is the healer of the whole world. Especially those who are oppressed. Especially those who you hate especially those others that ain't part of us, see? Uh, oh, he, he wasn't done. That was just one. <laughs> the second one, there were also many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha, the other prophet. None of them was cleansed except who? You remember this? Nathan the Syrian, the enemy. And what did the people do? Did they applaud <laughs> You remember what they did when they heard this. All the synagogue was filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill to throw him off the cliff. Let's keep Christ in Christmas. <laughs> right? Let's not make it trite or sentimental. And there's a part of me that does that. I'm not going to give it all up, I'll be honest. But when people say, let's keep the Christ in Christmas, let's keep the Christ in Christmas. Okay. Uh, it was right at the end of uh, the first part of school for a little kid named Chris Carrier. Lived in Miami, Florida. And uh, it was the day before the two-week Christmas vacation, which we called it back then. Christmas vacation, 10-year-old, fifth grader, he loved it. He was dancing out of school two weeks off from school. Christmas vacation. He lived five blocks from the house, or from the school. His house was five blocks. So he's walking home. He gets about two blocks from school, and a white van pulls up next to him. And this was in the days before the, the fancy little electric door window, turning the window down, opening the door. He reaches across, and he and cranks the, the window and he says, hey, are you Chris Carrier? And Chris was a nice kid, brought up in the church, polite and respectful. And he says, yes. He goes, I'm a friend of your dad's. We're having a little birthday party for him. Hop in. We'll go and you can be the balloon guy. How's that? And Chris says, yeah. 
gets in the van and they drive for about 20 minutes. Soon they're out of Miami into the Everglades. And about an hour after that, Chris is getting nervous. The man jumps out of the front seat, grabs Chris, throws him on the ground, takes a tire iron and beats him and shoots him. 10 years old and leaves him. Three days later, some hunters, some deer hunters found him, brought him to the hospital, and he actually survived. They never found the man who did this. Now, Chris is blind in one eye. His arm has been broken irreparably. It'll never work the same. He's got bruises all over his face, and he now becomes the marginalized at school. Why? Because he's not part of the main tribe. Can you imagine this now? You're in middle school. You're getting ready for high school, all the way through high school. Thank God he had his friends, which were good to him. He had the backing of his parents, his family, his church. He knew about Jesus Christ, the reason for the season. He knew about faith. He tried to live it. But when all the other guys, by the time they were seniors, were dating, he couldn't have any dates. No one would go. I mean, he was disfigured. So he's living life as best he can with some great friends and his church. And then at age 25, a woman falls in love with him, sees beyond the eye that doesn't work, the bruises that will last a lifetime, sees the true beauty in his heart. And they marry and they have two beautiful kids. And then in 1970, and Chris was then in his late 30s, he gets a call from a deputy sheriff in Miami. And it goes like this. Hello? Hello, are you Chris Carrier? Yes. He said, I'm deputy sheriff down here at a nursing home in Miami. And I just want to preface this by saying you can't do anything about this. Uh, time has gone by, and this man is crazy. He, uh, he's got dementia. He's dying. He doesn't have much time left. And he's making all kinds of wild claims. None of them are consistent. And he says, years ago, he killed Chris Carrier. There was silence. And Chris said, I should like to meet him. He said, oh, no. <laughs> what for? He said, I just, uh, I like visiting people during Christmas. It was the season of Christmas tide just as it had been when he was abducted and brought out into the Everglades, see? And the, and the deputy says, uh, I don't know if that's proper. Let me check that out. And he says, okay, if two policemen are there, you can go visit him for an hour. He says, great, thank you. He goes down to visit him. He walks in the door and he sees this poor frame of a man 67 pounds. He's got lung cancer because he smoked all his life. His liver is shot because he drank all his life. He can barely talk, but he's still ornery. <laughs> and he says, who the heck are you? And Chris walks in. Chris says, oh, I'm here to visit. I visit people during Christmas. Well, sit down, he says. You play poker? And Chris, who'd never played poker very well, said, oh, I sure do. He said, get the cards. They're sitting right there. Who'd you say your name was again? Chris doesn't tell him. He says, oh, I'm coming here to visit you. All right, play your hand. <laughs> they play for an hour and a half, and the policeman says, it's time to go. And Chris says, just a couple more. We're having so much fun. And they were having lots of fun. And uh, the man says, all right, I asked you who you were. My name's David McAllister. What's your name? He goes, I'm just a visitor. That's all I am. I come to visit people and to spread some Christmas joy. Is it Gaudette Sunday today? And uh, he said, uh, I'd like to come tomorrow night. Can we play some more? You bet we'll play some more and I'll kick your rear again, says David McAllister. And he comes the next night and they play that. And he comes a third night and he's lost so many times. He says, David, do you know how to play chess? He goes, yeah, and I can whoop you in that. Get out the chessboard. And they play for a couple hours chess. And what is happening is they are becoming friends. And on that third night, Chris Carrier says, David, 
I have a wife and two kids. I've told them how much fun we're having. Do you mind if they meet you? And of course, the family knew all about what was happening, see. He said, bring them on in. I haven't seen a good-looking lady in a while. And uh, he brings in his wife and his two kids, and they talk for a while. And it's obvious. I mean, he's on his last leg. There's not much of him left. There's a lot of swearing and a lot of stories that are incoherent. And he's got dementia. Did I mention he has dementia? You know what dementia is like? It's like when my mother had dementia the last two years of her life, by God, she could remember everything about her youth, but she couldn't remember what she had for breakfast. See, Some of you are aware of that, right? Uh, I don't mean you here. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You can remember all these experiences vividly, like they're on the palm of your hand. My mother would do this all the time, but she couldn't remember even her name. And... Uh, on that last night, Chris came in and said, uh, David, I'd like to tell you something. What? He said, I'd like to tell you my name. Do you see where this is going? My name is Chris Carrier. And David McAllister almost died on the spot. He turned white. And he said, why are you visiting me? And you know what Chris said? To forgive you. That's why. Oh, what, what did our lesson say? What was the great Isaiah? The Lord has put a sign on me and appointed me to bring good news to the oppressed. Do you know that Chris was oppressed by David McAllister? Yes. But you know who else was oppressed? David McAllister. All those years. Because he confessed it. See? To bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners. You can be a prisoner in your own nursing home room, in your own upstairs, in your own nice little fireside room, and many are. And Christians are the sign of the light of Christ, and not some saccharine sentimentality but the very power of God. Uh, David McAllister died just about two weeks later. A happy man. All the nurses said it. They said, we don't know what you did. Something happened to David. He wasn't as ornery. He wasn't as mean. What does it mean to keep the Christ in Christmas? To know who that Christ was. To know that he trumps every bit of tribalism that we got in our own lives. And we got them. All of us. And the church is supposed to be a sign of this unconditional love. And sometimes we are and sometimes we aren't. And the church doesn't find its values on either the left or the right of politics. Neither one. Nor does it find itself in the center of those two, as if, you know, if you just took the extreme right and extreme left of politics, you know, somehow Christianity is in between. No, Christianity is a whole different ball game. It is to be a people who don't define themselves either way, but define themselves as the Christ who loves all unconditionally, even those who hurt us, especially we might say, those who hurt us. The world's values often clash with Christ's values. That's the way it's always been, and that's the way it continues to be in our day. But we have our lives still, as long as we are breathing, and we are imperfect, yes. But I remind you that Martin Luther, in that great uh, exhortation about how we are saint and sinner, and that great exchange, which he didn't make up, but he featured. He said, the great exchange is that we give Christ all of our half-baked ideas, all of our goodness, our personality, the junk of our lives. And Jesus, in turn, gives us everything he is. His love, his light, his grace, his goodness, his patience. In fact, Luther went so far, and I couldn't believe this when I first read it, 
he also gives us his divinity. And what he meant by that, of course, was what the Gospels talk about perichoresis, the God, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit come and make their home in us. So here's the good news, Christian. If you're as half-baked as I am about keeping the Christ in Christmas, remember, God is not looking for a perfect person. God's looking for you. And God found you. And God is not letting go. Trust the story. Reach out. Be the sign of Christ that is unique among all other signs in the world. And do it with imperfection and thank God for it. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. Be the sign of Christ today. Amen.